a few months ago, it was late night, really cold, raining cats and dogs. I don't know, it was about 11 o'clock at night. I get a phone call, and it's Miss Sue, and she has distress in her voice. And she says, my car won't start, it's dead. Should I call AAA? Well, I said, no, no, not yet. I got this. <laughs> With my mechanical prowess. Um, so I grabbed my flashlight, jumped in the car, and on the way over there, I'm really praying, oh, Lord, we've had so many car repairs lately. It's crazy. We've replaced all, just about everything and new tires. We don't need a, uh, and I don't know, why won't the car start? The starter went bad, maybe the alternator went bad, or the, the thingamajig on the whatchamacallit is not working. <laughs> So uh, I was just saying, Lord, just let it be something real simple. And I remembered underneath the back seat of my pickup, I had this little bag I'd never actually opened before. But it was just what I needed. It was perfect. So I arrived, and uh, as soon as I arrived, I pulled out my flashlight. But, you know, it was pouring down raining, so I didn't want to get soaked and electrocuted or whatever. So I was holding my... So I'm holding my umbrella, I've got the flashlight like this, I raise the hood of her car, and with the other hand, I'm, I'm putting the cables on one at a time. Two ladies came by with an umbrella, and she's going, sir, you look like you need some help. I said, no, I got this. <laughs> so I connected the cables to my truck, and then I connected them to hers, and it went, and started sparking. So I took them off and then put them on the correct way, and it made a real big difference. And I, I said, crank it immediately, boom, voila, it cranked. And for at least a moment, I was Sue's hero because I gave her a jump start. Well, you know, it occurs to me sometimes we feel like in our spiritual journey, our spiritual battle, uh, battery is running low. Now we have a backslidden you know, our, our, our spiritual life's not totally falling apart. We're just running a little low. We're dragging a little bit. We're in a spiritual slump. Our passion, our, our, our spiritual habits and disciplines are waning. Pastor James knew that would happen, and he gives us a great word on how we can jumpstart our spiritual life. So I'm going to invite you to find James chapter 4. It's toward the end of your New Testament. James chapter 4. You know, the whole purpose of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, the whole purpose of our refresh week starting tomorrow, the whole purpose of this sermon series, let's get physical, I mean spiritual. Let's get spiritual. In fact, there's, a, uh, there's an outline. I laid mine down somewhere else. Uh, but there's a little blank outline that says, let's get spiritual jumpstart your spiritual life. So this whole series and this message in particular is really designed for you to get your year in gear. Your year, Y-E-A-R, in gear and uh, get on the right path. I recently read where this great violinist of the 20th century named Mishka Elman was walking down the streets of New York City, and a tourist stopped him and said, Excuse me, sir, can you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? He started to answer, and he waited a moment. He said, Yes, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> True, isn't it? Gary Player, who was probably the most successful golfer of the last century anyway, said he lost count of how many times people came up to him and said, uh, Gary, I would give anything if I could hit the ball the way you hit the golf ball. He said he heard it so much, and one day after a particular grueling time on the golf course, he was walking into the clubhouse, and a man goes, it's a, put his hand on his shoulder and says, uh, it's okay, good day, Gary. I, I'd give anything if I could hit the ball like you. And he said he had heard that so much, he couldn't help but respond. And he turned around and said, no, you wouldn't. You would only do it if it's easy. 
If you want to hit the ball like me, then you need to get up every morning of your life at 5 a.m., go out to the driving range, and hit 1,000 golf balls. And then go into the clubhouse, soak your hands in cold water, then put band-aids on all the places your hands are bleeding, go back out to the driving range, and hit another 1,000 golf balls. Then you might be able to hit like I hit. Well, I think what he was saying... Spiritual discipline is important. Practice is very important. You know, inspiration, motivation, enthusiasm will only take you so far. We need spiritual disciplines, not just motivation. We need self-discipline. That's where prayer, fasting, studying God's Word, worship, they all come into play. When you use the word discipline, nobody really likes that word. It's about as exciting as yesterday's chewing gum. The discipline. Now, you're going to see, there's, there, there's another side to this that I think is going to give us some encouragement today. James chapter 4, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? James chapter 4. Now, we'll really commence reading in verse 3. Verse 2 is that famous scripture where James says you have not because you ask not then he says in verse 3 and when you do ask you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures you adulterous people don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God or do you think that the scripture says without reasons that God's jealousy longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in you, in us? But God gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and He will lift you up. Now, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. You're my rock, and you're my redeemer. And I would be remiss if I didn't pray for the Skinner family. I want to thank you. I know Joanne Skinner is in the presence of God himself, that she's in your, your hands. To be absent from this body is to be present with you, Lord. So I'm praying that you'll be with them during the memorial service in the morning. Wrap your big, strong arms around this family, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm getting just a little bit of ringing here, guys, a little bit of feedback. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Now, if you're going to jumpstart your spiritual life, there are several things Pastor James says that you need to do. And I want you to take your blank outline you were handed. I want you to jot these things down. These are things you can put on your mirror, on your dashboard. You can remind yourself of these things. Because as you look at 2020, I don't know what you want. You could just tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Um, <laughs> And whatever it is that you do want, I think James gives you a clear path how to receive that this year. So the first thing he says, if you're going to jumpstart your spiritual life, the first thing he says is kneel down. Amen. Kneel down in prayer. You have not because you ask not. And sometimes you have not because you're asking for the wrong things. You're asking for your own selfish glory. He later says the effectual fervent prayer of righteous people releases much power. Now, the problem is when we start talking about prayer, typically whenever we talk about prayer, we go to one of two extremes. Either one, we just get totally intimidated and make prayer so mystical, you know, so difficult. Only the super duper super Christians are real, we call them prayer warriors. They, they pray and they bombard heaven and God hears their prayers. God gives them answers to the prayers. They see the miraculous. 
And so often we pastors, we get up and we give you examples of great saints who have been people of prayer. You know, Martin Luther, John Wesley, uh, these great men and women, Susanna Wesley, great prayer warrior. Uh, you know, we, we give that to you and rather than inspiring you, we discourage you because you go, well, I'm, I'm not that super duper saint. And I'm glad they spent two to three hours every morning. But you know what? They probably didn't have a bunch of kids to get out of bed and get ready and fix breakfast, fix their lunches, take them to school, go to work, work 10, 12 hours a day, come home, cook for the family, clean the house, do the wash. I'm really glad they had that kind of time that they could pray. And so we just kind of totally dismiss it as not attainable. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty today because I have discovered most Christians already feel guilty about their prayer life. Most Christians feel inadequate. And if you ask, probably if I ask every one of you, how many of you could have a stronger prayer life? Probably 99% of you would raise your hand and then 1% would lie about it, not raise your hand. Most feel guilty and inadequate. So that's an extreme to get intimidated by prayer. The other opposite extreme is just to get lackadaisical about it. Ho-hum. No big deal. And, and for them, prayer seems like texting a friend so casual, like you want to do dinner in a movie? Uh, it's just this casual thing. And prayer becomes a very lightweight Thing in our life, spiritual discipline in our life. Instead of coming into the presence of the Almighty God, Creator, and go, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, they feel like they're just coming to a friend who's not paying much attention to them when they talk. They're checking their Instagram while we're talking to them. No, listen, when you talk to God, you have His full attention. Prayer's not easy. Fasting is not easy, but I appreciate so much all the, I mean, we, a ton of you have signed up for the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Some of you are fasting for 21 days and doing the Daniel fast. Susan and I are doing the Daniel fast. It's not easy. I mean, it, it really isn't. We, yesterday, we passed Ranger Burgers. <laughs> Ranger Burger re reopened. When I saw it, I almost jumped out of the moving car. I'm like... No, it's not easy to say no. I said, yeah, and it won't be long until we can come back here. No, it's, it's not an easy discipline. Prayer is not an easy discipline. And, you, and many of you are fasting many of your luxuries in life and things in life to be able to quiet in your body and your desires down and hear from God and have God answer your prayer. So there, definitely, prayer, fasting, it's a discipline. But can... Can we look at it as not a heavy, heavy burden, but an incredible privilege, an incredible gift of God? He's given us the opportunity to come into his presence. He's given us the opportunity to collect with the Lord of the universe, to grow deeper in our spiritual life, to get answers to our prayer, to see breakthroughs in our life and our family's life. No wonder God says, I invite you to come and pray. I want you to come and pray. I encourage you to come and pray. So kneel down. Sign of submission and surrender. So if we're going to jumpstart our life, then the first thing we do, what, what is it? Kneel down. Here's the second thing we do. Fight back. Fight back. Verse 7, he says, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil. And he will, what? Flee from you. Now, let me tell you the coolest thing about this verse. It is both, it is both a command and it's a promise at the same time. The command is submit to God. Resist the devil. But the promise is if you do, Satan is going to flee from you. He's going to hightail it out of there. He's going to leave you for the moment. See, by ourselves, we can't win. But with God, we can't lose. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. He says, resist the devil. Resist. That's a great word. Our military folks really understand that word. Resist is a great military word that means I'm not going to retreat. I'm not going to step back. I'm going to step up. I'm not going to retreat. I'm going to advance. The only thing we're told to flee from is temptation. 
Otherwise, we fight. Ephesians 6.10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And put on the full armor of God. You need to be equipped for battle. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we should not be surprised when He attacks us. We just should fight back. When He hits you out of the blue, fight back. When Satan attacks your finances, fight back. When he tries to cripple your body, fight back. When he tries to seduce you with temptation, fight back. When he tries to mentally molest you and get depression and defeat in your mind, fight back. When he tries to attack your business, fight back. When he tries to attack your children, fight back. When you feel he tries to make you feel hopeless that nothing is ever going to change, fight back. And know there's always a breakthrough. There's always a fresh start. When your Lord is involved. Let me tell you about this guy. The devil. He's a murderer. He's the ultimate terrorist. Jesus said I've come that you might have life. And have it to the full. Have it abundantly. But he has come to kill. He's come to steal. He's come to destroy. Let me tell you something about Satan. He doesn't fight fair. Yeah you know there, there are these international rules of war and engagement and so forth. Uh, he doesn't pay attention to any of that. No, because he wants to destroy you. And he doesn't care what he has to do to do it. He wants to destroy your health, your career, your marriage, your family, your ministry. I mean, it's reality. This is not a fairy tale, folks. Satan and all of his devils in hell, even this moment, are shouting and chanting, Death to Christians! Because... Satan has come to kill. But what do we do? One, we fight back. We, how do we fight back? We fight back with the Word of God. We fight back and plead the blood of Jesus. We fight back through worshiping and singing wonderful praise songs. We fight back through prayer. We fight back through fasting. We fight back through leaning on our brothers and sisters. We fat, fight back when we take Holy Communion like we did. We're going to be fighting the devil when we have baptism service this Wednesday night. We, f we, we fight the battle when we flee from temptation. We stand and we fight. Satan's strategy is, is much like that of a good football coach. A good football coach studies the opposing team. Do you know that Satan has game films on us? Oh, he's watched what we do. He knows my weaknesses. He knows my strength. And he uses what he knows against me. So it's not by accident that the Bible says we're like soldiers. In fact, the there's no picture of the Christian life more frequently cited than that of a soldier. You're in the Lord's army now. And he says, fight the good fight of faith. He says, endure hardship like a good soldier. Now, here's the good news. We're going to win this fight. This fight's been fixed. We know we're going to. The Bible says we are more than conquerors. The Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The Bible says that Satan can form no weapon against us that's ever going to prosper. Oh, we, may have a, we may have some hard times, but we're going to win in this battle. But we have to adopt this warfare mentality. I, I heard somebody last week during all of this going on with, in, in our world, and particularly um, this past week with the with the uh, air uh, uh, str drone strikes and, and Iran striking back at one of our military bases and so forth. But I heard this military strategist that goes, and somebody was saying, well, do you think we're going to, you think we're going to declare war? And this man said this, he said, we are always at war with terrorism. And as soon as he said that, boy, it just clicked in my brain. I said, you know, that's a, that's the way it is in this spiritual war warfare. We are always at war with our enemy. We can never relax. You go, oh, you know what? I've got a peace treaty with the devil. I got this deal. You leave me alone, and I'll leave you alone. Well, can I tell you? He doesn't keep his peace treaties. He will violate everyone. He will promise you the moon, and he will come to destroy. So 
we always have to be on our highest alert. Our spiritual terroristic alert system should be permanently stuck on red. We're in the battle now. This is a, it's a battleground, not a playground. It's a battleship, not a love boat. So we got to prepare. So if we're going to jumpstart our spiritual life, the first thing we said we got to do is kneel down. The second thing, fight back. Third, draw near. Draw near. Verse 8. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. See, the question is not how near is God to us. The question is how near are we to God? Now, Every married couple here can pretty much say amen to this. Proximity is one thing, but intimacy is something else. When you talk about drawing near to someone, you can be very near, though. A couple can be together on a couch and be miles apart. Or they can be apart and, and literally be together. Uh, last week, Susan and I uh, did yard work all Pretty much all afternoon, uh, she dragged me outside to do some yard work, and, and we worked for hours, literally. I blew leaves, picked up, I can't believe how many limbs we picked up. and We picked up debris. I picked up small limbs. She raked and picked up really big limbs. <laughs> She's got a strong back, unlike me. But that was so interesting. At the end of the day, she looked at me and said, she smiled and said, I really enjoyed spending the day with you. And I'm thinking, yeah, that was sweet. I'm thinking, I, we didn't chat during the, well, you know, we didn't hold hands while we were working. I mean, you know, to me, that's something I would say when we go to the movies and watch Star Wars and eat two bags of popcorn and snuggle up. Yeah, I really enjoyed what, no, she, I enjoyed being with, we were not really proximity in proximity together, but she felt close to me. Yeah, you want to please her, do work. She'll feel close to you, I promise you. <laughs> Listen, you come to God with a desire to know Him, you can know Him. You don't have to be a, a seasoned saint of 50 years following the Lord. You don't have to have your master's degree in theology. All you have to do is take a step toward him, and you know what? He takes a step toward you. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. And so you could be the newest saint or the weakest believer, but you can experience the presence of God in your life. Now, you may be saying, you know what? I want, one time I felt really close to the Lord, but he just feels like he's far away now. Well, guess who moved? Because it wasn't the Lord. He desires for you to step toward Him. So if I'm going to jumpstart my life, then the first thing I have to do, what was it? Kneel down. The second thing, fight back. The third thing, and here's the fourth thing, clean up. Verse 8. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James says, clean your hands because they're dirty. Clean your heart because your hearts are divided. Yeah, you're serving the Lord, but you're also serving the enemy. The heart is not a duplex. There's only room for one person in there. So he says, clean your act up. Now, what does that really mean? Well, it means we stop making excuses and take responsibility. We stop excusing our bad habits our unkindness, our put-downs, our dabbling in pornography, our bragging and, and being arrogant about our accomplishments. We stop making excuses for unforgiveness and bitterness and a critical spirit. We stop making excuses for hating our enemies. We stop making excuses for our prayerlessness. Now, one of the most useful things you can do during this 21 days of prayer and fasting or during this week of refresh is just take a, just take a couple of moments while you're praying Take a pen and say, Lord, reveal to me some stuff in my heart that I need to, to, to get right, that need to be cleansed. And you, you may be surprised. You may be shocked. You may be appalled at some of the things he shows you. But for goodness sakes, don't stop there. 
when you make the list, take the list, say, Lord, take care of it, and then tear it up. Let him cleanse you of that. See, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. It's kind of what that prophet Hosea, way back, that ancient prophet Hosea in Hosea 10, 12 said this, break up the unplowed ground in your own heart for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. Now, listen, plowing is hard. I've done it. Uh, Sue had me digging a ditch. Uh, what, what were we doing? We put in a sprinkler system. We dug it all by hand. I dug it all by hand. We dug it all by hand. Sorry, correction. It was hard. We ran into tree roots. We had to get a pickaxe. We ran into rock. Plowing is hard work. Plow up the unplowed ground of your heart. So if you do that, if you do the hard thing, God promises he will send rain. <laughs> and that rain will produce new life and new joy and new meaning and new power fresh from heaven itself. Yeah, do it. You go, well, uh, it's, it, it, I, I just let it go. One of these days. Now listen, if you heard you had cancer, you could not wait to get that cut out of your body. That's the way God views our sin. And if we grasp that, then we'll immediately clean up. So what is the first thing we do if we want to jump start? Kneel down. down, Fight back. Number three. Number four. Clean up. Number five. Get serious. Are you serious? Grieve. Mourn. Wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. This is not... That's not a refrigerator verse. You know, I got some verses on my refrigerator, but this isn't one of them. I've never seen this on a t-shirt or bumper sticker. Mourn, grieve, wail. I I don't want to mourn. I want to not worry and be happy. I don't want to weep. I want to laugh. I mean, is James a party pooper? Is he a colossal killjoy? Is he this negative? What is he doing? And I have to, the more and more I read this, I step back and look at it in the context of everything James is telling us in his book. And I've just really come to this conclusion. What James is saying is we just got to get serious about our relationship to God. We just don't need to be haphazard and just blow off everything, go, well, you know. Do you know what I've discovered? Most folks, even even folks that don't go to church, know they're sinners. And if you say, are you a sinner? They go, well, yeah, you know, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes, but it's just not that big of a deal. It's not some big thing. I'm not committing adultery i'm not killing and murdering anybody so it's not that big of a deal it's not hard to get people to admit the concept of sin and them being a sinner let me tell you the bible goes much further than that the bible the bible gives us this grasp of sin that it has infected and affected every part of our life because of sin we're spiritually dead because of sin We are spiritually blind. Because of sin, we are spiritually lost and separated from God. And sin is what drove Jesus to the cross to reconcile us. And we're all in that boat. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short. And the word sin means you see a target and you aim at it, but you completely miss it by a mile. Sin means missing the mark. We've all missed the mark. The whole human race has missed the mark, so we're lost. We're broken dead we're blind we're deaf to god's truth we're all in a state of rebellion and listen to god's verdict on the whole human race romans 6 23 the wages of sin is death i heard a guy say not too long ago he's teaching goes doesn't pay to serve the devil i go oh yeah it does and it's expensive the wages of sin is death it does pay It pays in death. It pays in eternal punishment. It pays in an eternal hell. Now, I know some of you go, but that is so harsh. Well, I just say, if that's harsh and you don't like to hear it, then as a famous movie line said, you can't handle the truth. Because that's the gospel truth. What we really need to do is look in the mirror and get an idea of how messed up we were or how messed up we are. Because small sinners only need a small Savior. 
Moderate sinners need a moderate Savior, but big-time sinners need a big-time Savior, and we have a big-time Savior. And by the way, we're all big-time sinners, so we need a big-time Savior. So we don't joke about our life away from God. We don't joke about our sin, but we start weeping, and we open the door of repentance. For, and, and God gives us His freedom, His, His forgiveness, His abundant life. So one more thing. If, if we're going to jumpstart our life, the first thing we said we do is kneel down. The second thing, fight back. The third thing, the fourth thing, the fifth thing, finally, stay low. The way up in the kingdom of God is the way down. You see, pride... If pride is the first sin, which, which it is, then humility is the first virtue. You know, one of the first rules of the spiritual life I, I learned early on, and that's an important one, and, and I'm sure you've learned it too, and that is, He is God and I'm not. He is in charge and I'm not. He's got the universe in control and I don't. And spiritual growth starts with the truth, you are God. And I humble myself and understand, and I give up control. I submit, you are God. And, and if you don't grasp that, you're going to stay in, in kindergarten. And, and let, let me say this. And I, if you've ever, I don't know how many of you are my Facebook friends. I'd love to be a Facebook friend with you. But let me warn you, you're going to get sick of it in, a, in about two days because all I do is post pictures of my grandkids. I mean, really, it's disgusting. I look at it and go, wow, I don't believe people even look at this because I just brag on my kids all the time, my grandkids, my kids. That's it. I mean, that's basically what my Facebook is, and sometimes I'll put a post about an upcoming message. But, uh, and I try to be, as, as I was even preaching this sermon a, a few moments ago, I was looking at my, my grandson, Micaiah, and I, I say it again and again. Is that Micaiah? Yeah, Micaiah. Yeah, thank you. I, I, can I talk about you a moment? Micaiah is awesome. He is a fabulous, let me tell you, he is a fabulous wrestler. And uh, if you've got time afterwards, I happen to have about 15 or 20 videos of the last two weeks of him just smashing his opponents and pinning them and medals. And uh, So what I've had to come to grips with is that there's a difference between ungodly, boastful, flamboyant pride and being pleased with your kids or your grandkids. Do you know, G God looked out of heaven at his son and said, I'm well pleased. <laughs> Good job. So I think there's a godly kind of pride. And I don't think Micaiah has to be embarrassed for the fact he's, he, he's a good wrestler. Here's the key. He doesn't go around flaunting it, saying, I'm the greatest. Look what I've done. You know, Ric Flair, mwah, mwah, kissing his... Yeah, there's only two people who've ever watched wrestling here in the back. You know, riding around in limousines, kissing all the girls and talking about how, you know, that, that, see, that's, there's a difference in exalting yourself and exalting Christ for the abilities he's given you and what Christ is doing through you. So don't be ashamed of your accomplishments. Just be careful he gets the glory. And when you're bragging on something, you give him the credit and say, and so what I'm learning to do let me tell you what the Lord has helped Micaiah do. And, and that's the way I put it. Let me tell you how pleased I am with it. He works hard. He exercises. He trains. And he just smashes his opponents for the glory of God. Uh, and I think that's okay. I don't think I'm justifying it. Humble yourself, James says. Uh, a number of years ago, I'm going to show you a little 30-second clip, and then we'll be done. And it, you, you've got to really pay attention because it comes by fast. But I'm going to set it up for you, or you'll totally miss it. it. It was a little clip on ESPN that went viral. And I don't think anybody meant for it to. I don't think this football player meant for it to go viral, but it did. Two years ago, January the 1st, 2018, Georgia played Oklahoma in the Rose Bowl. Any Georgia football fans here? Go dogs. Hey, my son went a couple years to Georgia, so it's scriptural that I be a Georgia fan because the, <laughs> the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Some of my treasure was at the University of Georgia called tuition, room and board. 
Well, I grew up in Oklahoma, so I had a little bit of a mixed feelings because I, I, I like Oklahoma. But I'm, a Geor- I'm Georgian, okay, through and through. So I was rooting for Georgia. And, at the, and it was a nail biter. It was an incredible Rose Bowl game. Uh, two, a, a double overtime. And in the double overtime, the dogs defeated the Sooners. And um, I, by the way, I've never been as big a fan as my mother. My mother was 80 years old and would never miss an OU football game on TV. She, she would call me afterwards and go through the whole play. Did you see her? No, Mom, I don't watch Oklahoma anymore. Uh, she called me one day and says, The doctor, my cardiologist says I've got to stop watching the OU games because my heart starts racing and fibrillating. <laughs> I never had that happen in any sporting event. The only time that ever happens was the first time I saw Sue across the college campus and my heart kind of... Yeah. <laughs> She's not buying that for one second, but it's true. It is true. I lie not. I totally forgot what I'm even talking about. Oh, the Rose Bowl game. Georgia defeated. Now, Oklahoma quarterback number six was an amazing quarterback. Every, you you got to give it. He was an amazing quarterback. He had just won the Heisman Trophy, but he was so cocky that a lot of sports commentators didn't like him. He had had some antics during the year. He apologized for them. He did some goofy things. He did some uh, very distasteful things, you know. And so he was just so cocky. And it, right before the Rose Bowl game, he, he had some antics down in the, in, in the Georgia end zone, really ticked Georgia off. So when Georgia beat them, they were walking off the field, and you'll see this in the clip. Number six, he's greeting the, you know, doing the typical greeting afterwards where the players greet one another. And a linebacker from Georgia sees the quarterback, and he says three times, humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself. So you got to really listen because they, they didn't get the microphone under him in time. So you really hear the third one. But I want you to see this clip. Georgia humbled them that day. In fact, when they were interviewing number six, he wasn't cocky at all. He broke down, was 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 weeping, and um, yeah, he they, they got humbled. But I, I don't think that linebacker from Georgia knew he was quoting the scripture when he said, "Humble yourself." That's exactly what James said in our text. Hum, turn to your neighbor and say, "Humble yourself." So I'm gonna tell you, it's a lot easier to humble yourself than to have circumstances or somebody else humble you. Verse 6, shocking verse, says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He opposes. He literally opposes. You can brag on yourself and exalt yourself, or you can brag on Christ and exalt Christ, but you cannot do both at the same time. So James says, humble yourself and exalt Christ in your life. You want to be blessed this year? You've got to humble yourself. You want to have a breakthrough in your spiritual life? Humble yourself. You want your prayers to be answered? You want to get closer to God? You want to draw closer to God than you've ever been? Humble yourself. And He promises that He will draw nigh to you. I want you to stand with me.